I'm on the share phone. Okay. Yeah. We are recording. I need to put up my Bible on the other screen. Full screen this. If I do this Hi. right. Well, hello. <laughs> They're joining today. Okay. And what and what are your names? What's your name? I'm Bristol and I'm Kinsey. Bristol and Kinsey. Well, I'm Miss Eleanor. Nice to see you. I've enjoyed yeah. getting to know your mama and your daddy some <laughs> at, at some of the Danny Johnson things. So so you guys can get your Bibles and follow along too and we'll kind of go from there. So it is, what is today? June 13th, I believe, and uh, 2018. So let's, if you would, ladies, let's, let's pray and then let's get our Bibles, okay? <laughs> Father Yahweh, Lord, thank you so much for, for your faithfulness, for your presence. You say we're two or more gathered in your name that there you are in the midst. And we invite you here, Father. I thank you that you... Uh, give your word that your son Yeshua is the word made flesh father and I ask that your Holy Spirit would direct this conversation that we would honor you with our conversation that we would honor you as we look in your word father open the eyes of our hearts to see and understand what you have for your people and May we learn to walk in your love in every aspect of our lives. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Messiah. Amen. Okay. Uh, all right. One of the things that I have just, in dealing with stuff, a, a lot of times I've had people just come in and they jump in and they just attack uh, when, when you say you're, trying to honor the tour or something like that so a couple of things to help lay a foundation on because uh, to me it's like coming in and 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 you're saying we're building a house we want to get the roof on and we want to pick a red roof and you're describing the roof and I'm going wait, wait we got to lay a foundation we're not ready for the roof on the house yet we got to lay a foundation we got to build walls and a framework and then we put the roof on and what I what I see so many people especially if you just look at what we commonly call the New Testament without having the foundation of understanding the context of what these people are talking about it makes it really easy to kind of come up with some wild conclusions that would have totally flabbergasted the first century writers <laughs> uh, of, of the scripture it's kind of like if I give you a book to read I assume you know the alphabet I assume you have a vocabulary that you'll know what the words mean that they just won't be sounds uh, on you know sounds coming up on the on the that you pronounce but you don't have a concept of what they mean so kind of getting the foundation is is giving that alphabet giving the basic vocabulary so we can read the book with some understanding of what it is so um, foundation is probably stuff we all all agree on that that there's only one God but he revealed himself as the father he revealed himself as the son and he also reveals himself as this Holy Spirit uh, in and we can go to scriptures that all three of those are spoken of equally as being God and worthy of worship. Um, so um, hopefully that's a foundation and I believe it's God's word from cover to cover that God's not schizophrenic, that Jesus wasn't schizophrenic, neither was Paul, neither were any of the writers so that if we're looking at things in the right context, there should be a consistency. You shouldn't have things that are diametrically opposed to each other. Um, and if we come to that conclusion, we need to, I think it would be logical, and I think uh, hopefully after we look at some of the scripture tonight, to realize that it would be logical to seem if I'm coming up with two different totally opposite 
uh, understanding. Maybe yeah. I'm not reading stuff in the right context. Okay. Um, one of the first things is the Word of God is eternal. Isaiah 40 verse 8. Right, and write these down. Go look them up. You probably know them anyway. It says, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. I learned that in Sunday school a long time ago. If you guys were in Sunday school as kids, you probably learned that too. Psalm 119, the whole, the whole psalm is a really good uh, chapter to read to get a concept of what uh, the writer thought about God's instruction. But Psalm 119, uh, just a few verses, verses 89 and 90. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Verse 152. Long ago I learned from your statutes that you established them to last forever. Verse 160. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. Okay, does that sound like something that will at some time be done away with? It says repeatedly, it's forever. It lasts forever. It's eternal. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Okay, so if this is God's word, and if you believe it's God's word from cover to cover, then it should be eternal. And uh, Jesus himself in Matthew 5, 18, we're going to look at this a couple of times. He said, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And I, th there may be some people, but I'm not aware of anybody who believes the Bible uh, to be the Word of God, who believes that all prophecy and everything has been fulfilled. That there's there's a lot of there's a lot of things that uh, in Revelation haven't been fulfilled for sure, but also in the Book of Daniel and and in Zechariah. And so there's there's a lot of prophecy that I don't know anybody that claims that it's been fulfilled. So he says until heaven and earth pass away. None of it's going to pass away until it's everything's been fulfilled. And you can look out your window right now and you can look up at the sky and see the heavens. And you can walk out on the earth. So heaven and earth have not passed away, I do not think. Um, and I think I can make a pretty good case for that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, if, so if God's word is eternal... That's a foundation to start with. And also, the Word of God made flesh is eternal. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He was in the beginning with God. And everything that was made was made with Him. That's the first few verses of, of Ch John chapter 1. And also in Hebrews 13.8, it said, uh, it's speaking of Jesus, said that, that, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the Word of God made flesh, so the Word of God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, Yeshua said he was one with the Father. Uh, in, in John 10, 30, he says, I and the Father are one. In John 5, 43, he says, I've come in my Father's name. John 17, 11, he says, Father, make them one as you and I are one. So there's this, there's this unity that if God revealed himself as the Father, God revealed himself as the Son, um, and God revealed also the, in, um, about the Holy Spirit in, I didn't get this one added, in John 16, um, Verse 13, and this is Yeshua speaking to the disciples, says, But when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. So, 
the Holy Spirit isn't going to be speaking on his own accord. He's only going to be speaking according to what God the Father and God the Son instruct. Okay, so we've got we've got a if you remember the word the unity, we have the akkad of one God, but he's also three, and I don't understand how that works together, but I know it says the Father is God, and scripture says that Jesus is God. First chapter of Hebrews talks about that. And John 16 talks about the Holy Spirit is his voice. So none of these entities are acting on their own agenda. So Jesus did not have his own agenda. Uh, he didn't come to straighten out the old man. Or anything like that. He said, I and the Father are one. He says, I only do the will of my Father who sent me. And I want to go back to Matthew 5. And uh, hang on just a minute. Get this loaded. Uh, a lot of folks are familiar with the Sermon on the Mount. Let's go down to... Okay, let me share my screen. See if I can do this. Okay, so now hopefully you can see this. Um, let me get that a little fuller. Um, this is still in the Sermon on the Mount, but starting in verse 17, how many of you heard this verse as an explanation that the law has been done away with. It says, and this is Jesus himself speaking, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Have you ever heard that verse before? Either of you do? Yeah, my pastor says that all the time. Okay. That's how he, that's how we don't have to follow the Sabbath, the true Sabbath. Okay, but what does... Or, um... Right. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, that is... I've, I've heard this verse very much abused. But what does, what does the first half of the verse say? Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. And yet, so many people say, I've not come to abolish them, but I've come to abolish them correct <laughs> because they're saying that fulfill means to abolish and yet I would ask yeah I mean basically that's what he's saying yeah so he has the second half of the verse contradicting the first half of the verse okay now and it's interesting if you look up the word fulfill it is the Greek word. If you have a concordance, which uh, is Strong's uh, Greek word 4137, if you want to look up that, uh, the word is pleru, and, it's, and it means to make full, to fill up, to render full, to consummate. When you fulfill your marriage vows, does that mean your marriage is now over? No. No. Okay. The word does not mean to abolish. In fact, he's the way it's worded, he says, don't think I came to abolish. Instead, I came to fill it full, to render full the commandments. That's what the word means. And for there is no way that fulfill means to do away with okay so and and he goes on to we already read verse 18 but let's read it again for truly i say to you until heaven and earth pass away not uh king james says one jot not one tittle but iota or dot in english in the english language the uh the dot is the dot over a lowercase i, and the iota is the cross over a lowercase t. <laughs> so, but basically, not one little decorative mark any of anything. None of it will pass from 
the law or the Torah until all is accomplished. There, uh, therefore, whoever uh, relaxes the law. Now, let's see. Let me. Uh, let me go to the English Standard. It's a little better version. Um, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? In fact, he says that um, whoever, uh, some uh, versions say whoever teaches anyone um, to ignore even the least of these commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. I always point it's interesting. Both of them will be in the kingdom of heaven. But do you want to be least in the kingdom of heaven or greatest? Right. And he says the ones who teach, who does them and teach them will be great in the kingdom of heaven. And right. uh, so if you read this in context, you can't you can't reasonably come up with the idea that the Torah has been done away with according to this because Jesus said specifically I didn't come to abolish it if he did he would be contradicting we just read multiple places and there's many more places that where God says his word is eternal it lasts forever it isn't done away with and Jesus himself said, until heaven and earth pass away, it won't be done away with. So to pull, a, pull half a verse out of context, you got to go, um, excuse me, but I think you are missing a point here. And How do they miss that, though? Like, my pastor, I really do look up to him. He's really incredible. At how do they, how do you how do you look past that? How do you not read that and say, wait a second, that doesn't make sense? Like, ha, do you get what I'm saying? Like, he's yeah. had forty plus years, it just and I'm just like four point. years in. Yeah. What do you say, Deanna? I said trying to justify it with just one little verse versus more of the chapter there. Yeah. Right, like I, I just don't understand how people could be so far away from the truth when he's not one to not read the Bible. You know right. what I mean? Like, I, I, just, I, it's hard for me to understand. Well, I, you know, and to ask and say, you know, the Bible says many times that the word of God lasts forever, and even Jesus in the first half of this verse says he didn't come to do away with it. So how can you right. make the second half of the verse say that he did do away with it? Right. And uh, and I've not, you know, I've the only, I have people who keep coming back to the word fulfill. And yet when you look up the meaning of the word fulfill in the Greek, it means to fill it full, to fully expound on it. It does not mean uh you know, it does not mean to to, to eliminate. So right. I I'm not sure. I've not heard. I've not heard anybody reasonably uh, explain this. And um, another place, a lot of uh, people will uh, say Paul that Paul said it was done away with, but there too. Paul did not have his own agenda. And uh, if you go to Acts 21, this is, a, I, I like going here because this is what what Paul did in his own testimony. I'm not needing to interpret his uh, writings. I can look at, at what he said and what his testimony is. And hang on, let me pull this up and we'll switch screens again uh, 
What group did you say that one was? Where are we going right now? We're going to X21. Okay. And uh, if you come down, uh, context, you know, the, the X follows his. Uh, uh, a lot of Paul's travels, missionary travels. This context is he's coming back to Jerusalem. It's the after his third and final missionary trip. And uh, so he's coming back to report to his elders and at the church at Jerusalem. And so if you start in verse 17, it says, When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. So he's reporting to the leaders of the church. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. Okay? So the people who sat under Paul's teaching, the result was they believed in Yeshua and they were zealous for the Torah, for the law. And the elders rejoiced in this. Okay? So if you're going to come along and read Paul's writings 2,000 years later and conclude that he says something negative about the, the Torah, um, maybe we're missing something. Because the people who physically heard him with their own ears, their result was that they believed in Yeshua, but they also were zealous for the Torah. Okay, and let's keep let's keep reading. Um, verse twenty-one said so they're all zealous for the Torah, and they have been told that about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs, and to forsake Moses means to forsake the Torah. That was the you know common. Uh, uh, synonym for referring to the Torah. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the, of the Torah. Okay, so there's not only is he the people who heard his teaching directly believed in Yeshua and were zealous for the Torah, but they were also saying for those who are saying that you're telling people to turn away, we want you to go pay for these guys' sacrifices so we can prove that there is absolutely no truth to what's been said about you, but that you keep Torah, that you live in observance of the Torah. And so, again, the people who heard Paul directly, they believed in Yeshua. They kept Torah and were zealous for it. The, the church in Jerusalem, apparently, they thought it was a good thing to keep Torah. And, in fact, they went out of their way to show, uh, to show people that Paul himself kept the Torah. And yet, I don't. Hopefully, you wouldn't argue that he didn't believe in Yeshua as the Messiah. But he was okay. Can you help me? Help. I guess I'm I'm confused. Okay. After after twenty, like when you started at like twenty one, break that down more for me. Who who? But they have been informed about you. Who's they? The the Jews that came or the. Or the Gentiles, like who? Who are we talking? Who's I, they? I, well, he's. Uh, if if you read on further, okay, it's a lot of it is the the religious leaders, particularly in Jerusalem, because he's going to go to the temple, and in, in the very next few verses, he's going to get arrested. They're going to raise up some trouble, and Paul's going to be on trial before Felix and Festus, and when he's on trial. Uh, even his enemies cannot prove that he's ever for, told a forsaken Torah. Even his enemies okay. cannot pr prove that. So, um, 
so a base basically um, this is just room this but they have been informed about you that you teach all the jews who are among the gentiles to forsake moses that is like a rumor right he's saying that is some it, people are saying paul's telling people to turn away from torah right and because he and and there were people who knew he, he was coming back you know he's he's been he's He's never left the Roman Empire, but he's been all around uh, the the northern shore of the Mediterranean um, for, and he's been gone like two or three years this time. So um, he he said that's why in verse um, they have been told about you that these these guys have been told that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses and. And so 22 says, I'll certainly hear that you have come. So they know you're going to be here. And so he, uh, you know, so they're saying to prove that there's nothing to it. We want you to do this publicly. We want you to take, uh, pay for these guys' sacrifices. And you can read back in Leviticus, it's a Nazarite vow. It's the one vow that, that an individual can make on his own to God. That's what they're talking about in 23? Um. Therefore, yeah, do what yeah. we tell you. We have right. four men who have to. Right, and it's and you it's, can read about that and um, look up the Nazarite vow. It's like Leviticus twenty six or something like that. Um, there and it's this. He sent four men, and there's like four sacrifices, four animals. There's like a calf and three sheep or something. So he's like, buy. He's wanting him to pay for sixteen animals. This this isn't a cheap thing. But basically, they're saying to, to show that you are keeping Torah, we want you to pay for this, go with these guys in public, and, 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 and uh, so people will see that you're walking according to Torah. And so verse 26 says, Then Paul took them in, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. Um, so he so was, that's where he proved that he follows the Torah. That's, uh, yeah, that's, he's basic, yeah, he's doing one of the sacrifices uh, of there. And, it, and basically, it's, he was setting himself apart for seven days. And that's what verse 27 is talking about. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, in fact, so that means Jews from the cities where he had been teaching, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who's teaching everyone, everyone, everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place, which he did not do. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So anyway, they stir up, and he gets arrested, and um, a Roman uh, guard comes and, and gets him and binds him, and then he. Uh, but Paul says, "Wait a minute, may I speak to him?" And and he speaks to to uh, to them. And goes on, and I, I'd encourage you just to read on to the end of the book of Acts because he uh, tries to speak to them, and but then they get really mad, and because he basically gives his testimony, and uh, and what made him mad especially was that God was making available to the Gentiles or the nations other than Israel, other than Judah, the good, the good news and sharing his word. And uh, uh, so verse 22, they had listened to him up to that point. Then they, they about rip him to pieces. And finally, just to keep him from uh, being mauled to death the the Roman officer takes him away and he goes on um, and he finds out Paul's a Roman citizen and then chapter 23 uh, he goes on he's before the council and 
He puts the Pharisees and the Sadducees against each other. He talks about the resurrection. There's a plot to kill him. And he's sent first to Felix the governor. And they get him there. And when he's on, and he goes on trial. Uh, and he says, we'll give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. This is quick overview because I want you guys to read it on your own. And in Acts 24, he's on trial before Felix. And he goes on and he says, uh, let's see, first of all, the, the people who are charging him in verse 5 say, we have found this man a plague, one who stirs up riots among all the Jews throughout the world and is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, but we seized him. Uh, you know, and they, they were going on. Then Paul replied, and he says, Knowing that for many years you've been a judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. You can verify that it is not more than 12 days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues. Neither did they prove to you what they now bring up against me. This I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the Torah and written in the prophets having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, that there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. And he goes on, he says, after I, I'm, I'm coming, he says, I'm, I, I was doing everything. And, uh, and, it, and it comes on that they can't, they can't prove that he did anything wrong. So, and you can read on later, he goes on trial before Festus. And nobody's ever, uh, nobody ever was able to prove. And by his own testimony, he said, I've done nothing wrong. I believe in the law and the prophets. I've, I worship that way. I worship the same way these guys do. They just don't like that I'm, a, a, that I'm a, of the sect of the Nazarenes. So, does that make sense? A little bit yeah and again yeah. again read for yourself the rest uh, starting in Acts 21 and read on about his testimony and you'll you'll find out you know he didn't um, he, he didn't uh, uh, disobey the Torah and he didn't encourage others to disobey the Torah um, in uh, let's see so, Deanna and Emily are just no video. Just you, Marcy. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, the thing to, uh, to realize, if it's God's word from cover to cover, which, and again, to me, it's like probably your pastor would say that. Would say it's God's word from Genesis to Revelation. And yet, in practice, they say, well, no, it's not. Some of it went and got done away with. Part of Jesus, the word made flesh, got done away with. Uh, and um, But according to Paul in 2 Timothy 3.16, he says, all scripture is God-breathed. Now, if you think about it, at the time that Paul said that and wrote that to Timothy, what was Paul? What was Paul calling scripture? What did he have that he called scripture? And it was the Old Testament. None of the New Testament had been written at that point. Except may, right. maybe the book of Mark and maybe the book of James at that point. But pretty much the re none of the what we call the New Testament had been written. And yet Paul said all scripture is God breathed. <coughs> right. And... Uh, so how do we how do we justify um so like to other people um so you know like we're we're you know participating in the sabbath and we're not eating unclean meats and but how do you like so when people are saying so why don't you follow the whole thing like if we're doing those things but i'm not going out of shack when i'm on my cycle like you get what i'm saying like if we're going to do part of it, how do you, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, and some of, some of you can't keep, there is no temple. There's no place to bring sacrifices. So that part of the Torah, we don't even have a way to keep. 
Uh, some of it right. is, is for when you're in the land. You're not living in the land of Israel yet. So some of that will not apply okay. to you. Okay. Uh, but okay. some of that you can. You There are things you could do. Uh, I, my, the way my husband put it, and I like I liked that, instead of saying I keep Torah, is that we seek to honor the Torah and seek to live a, to- uh-huh. a Torah honoring life. Um, and basically because Jesus is the Torah made flesh. And Jesus said uh, in John fourteen fifteen, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So for me, it's because I love my Savior, who is the Word of God made flesh, who is God, the Son, and the Word of God lasts forever. And so Jesus said, if I love him, I'll obey him. So as best I can. So then how do you combat, like, so I have a few friends, like, I'm already a weird, like, you know, we're already a weird family. Yeah. But now that all of this, they're like, you're you're being so religious. Like, you know, it's it's the intentions of your heart. You don't have to do all these things to get into heaven. It's that is their cop out. Is it's not a it's not a um it's not a to do list. It's a to be list. It's right. And he says, "Be my people." Okay, but it's also. Again, a, a, a common thing. They're saying, well, you're trying to count on the law to save you. The law was never meant as a means of salvation. It's never. Right. You will not find anywhere in the Torah where it says, do this and you'll be saved. You will find where he says, because you're my people, this is the way I want you to live. So uh, Deuteronomy 4 says, so it'll be a testimony to the nations around you. Um, and and it's supposed to be so you'll be a light to the nations it's also he said so if you walk in my if you walk according to my instruction you you put yourself in a place where i can bless you and all if your children while they're in your home you can clothe them and protect them and provide for them if they ran away from home that's how a good can, one <laughs> how can you clothe them how can you protect them you might want to or, or if they go on a, you know, a shooting spree, go kill a bunch of people and get put in prison. They're a little young for that, but, but, <laughs> but you know, uh, you would still want to, but they would have removed themselves from your protection because of their choices. And um, so, not following the the Torah, you are really removing yourself from protection. In in a lot of ways, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's, uh, it's something that. I get to keep, not because I have to, but because I love him, I want to. I mean, does does your husband have a favorite dish, a a food or something, you know, a favorite food? And if you, you know, if you want to do something special for him, you make that particular, whatever it is, fried chicken and mashed potatoes or whatever. Uh, You know, we do things for people we love. And, I, you know, if we truly love them, we usually look to try to do things for them that we know they will appreciate. If you were deathly allergic to daisies and your husband kept bringing you daisies, as, you know, and they make you sick with sinus infection and everything, after a while you go, honey, I, I, I appreciate your in- the intention of your heart, but please, I'd, you know, bring me roses or, or daffodils or something, but don't bring me daisies because I, I can't, uh, I'm allergic to them. And, and, this, and it's the same sort of thing that it was, the Torah was never a means of salvation. I've used the example, any more than your washing machine was ever designed to cook your dinner. Okay, your washing machine has a purpose that purpose is to clean your clothes, but your it does not have the purpose of cooking your dinner. And if you tried to get it to cook your dinner, people would really think you're weird. If you were, you know, if your right. husband came home and you're standing there stirring a pot of soup or something on top of the washing machine and say, "Honey, I can't get this soup to get hot," you know, I'm trying to cook dinner. It was never designed for that. Torah was never designed as a means of salvation. Torah in its truest sense just about every Hebrew word has multiple 
meanings and it, and it doesn't mean it's one or the other he, Torah means it is instruction yes it's law it is a national constitution it's also a wedding agreement a ketubah it's I mean it's got a fourfold at least nature to it um that basically he says if you're going to be my bride you know when you when you get married if you're going to be if you're going to be his bride usually you know traditionally you take you're going to take his name you're going to live with him you're going to bear his children uh that's part of being his bride uh, of of your groom okay uh if you're going to mm-hmm. live in a country supposedly you're going to obey the laws of that land um we have people who say you shouldn't have to i know that you know that's the whole political thing with the illegal immigrants but people who say no they broke the law they're not so they shouldn't be here um if you're going to to be a member of an organization uh usually you have some bylaws and uh, you know, a constitution or some sort of covenant agreement of these are the rules of this organization. The Torah includes all of those. But it's even more because it's the way we can walk more fully in the design the Father created us for. Right. And rather than in what man has made up. Okay, so, um, so when people say you're 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 trying to, I'm I'm not. It's not a means of salvation. I have no problem. Right. It's absolutely not a means of salvation. I am saved by the sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Yeshua was his Hebrew name. That and my acceptance of his gift is what saves me but because I am his child because he has saved me and because I love him I want to honor him and he said if I love him I will obey him and that's still that's still the case today um and there there's just some verses that uh people tend to to overlook people will go to Jeremiah 31 and 3131 gets quoted a lot let me I'm going to pull it up and share the screen again uh, it takes me just a little bit share the screen let's go okay this is Jeremiah 31 let's go down to verse 31 I think is where it starts yeah okay it says behold the days are coming declares Yahweh you see Lord in little caps that's the word Yahweh his his name Hebrew name when I will make a new covenant now here the word new is Hadash and it's again look it up in the concordance 2319 it is the same letters as the word for moon or month Chodesh and we actually just tonight's is the new moon okay um, the Chodesh is not when the moon we talk about a new moon we do not mean that there is a new physically created uh, astral body in the sky that was formed tonight with the new moon. Correct? Right. We're saying what we mean it is renewed or refreshed. So when we talk about the new moon each month, we're not talking about a new physical ball in the sky. We're talking about the same. Uh, body but it gets renewed and refreshed and that's what that word Hadash means it means new or fresh so he's, he's basically saying I'm gonna make a refreshed covenant with the house of Israel 
and the house of Judah. Now look who the covenant is with. It's with the house of Israel. It's with the house of Judah. The two houses of, of the whole house of Israel. There is no covenant with the Gentiles. You cannot find a covenant with the Gentiles that God makes anywhere. His covenants he makes are with the whole house of Israel. The northern kingdom was called Israel or Ephraim. The southern kingdom was called Judah. So if we're not grafted into his people Israel, we're not part of this covenant. We're not eligible to be part of the covenant. That's another thing that will kind of blow people away. But he says, this is not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares Yahweh. And there too, there, because it was, the, it was the wedding ketubah they broke. And he goes on, this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares Yahweh. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people and no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother say no Yahweh for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares Yahweh now it's interesting he says I will put my law within them so basically the new covenant is moving from the ta the law of the Torah written on tablets of stone versus being engraved in our hearts but it's the same law it's a fresh covenant not a new law so if the law has been done away with as some people teach there's nothing for him to write on our hearts <clears throat> but he said I'm gonna put my law so again here he's not saying that there's something new the covenant there's a re refreshed covenant that he's making Okay, um, Paul uh, reiterates this and just real fast. Well, let me just read them and you look them up later. Okay, um, Romans 3.31, Paul says, uh, Do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. He's saying faith doesn't replace the law. It establishes it and confirms it. Uh, in Romans 7, 12, he says the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Not that the law was, but that it is holy, righteous, and good. Does that sound like something we don't want in our lives? Right. Um, you know, and we already read 2 Timothy 3.16 where he said all scripture is God breathed. So it's it's all there. It's all eternal. And just to uh, touch on a couple of things that, that uh, you'd ask about, you know, Sabbath was sanctified at creation. You read that on the seventh day of creation. God blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. There's no place in Scripture where he removes that blessing. And I would challenge your, challenge your preacher or whoever to say, show me where God removed his blessing and his, <coughs> his sanctification from the Sabbath. <coughs> Excuse me. And I don't know of any place you can find it. So, and it was, you know, it was the fourth commandment. Before, right. God, before God told me, I don't know if they're listed in order of priority, but before he told me to honor my parents, before he told me not to murder or lie or commit adultery, he told me to remember his Sabbath and keep it holy. And it was important enough to him to write it with his own finger on tablets of stone. So that kind of indicates it might be pretty important to him. So right. he sanctified it at creation. He listed it before he gave us any other instructions about how to relate to one another. He said, remember my Sabbath and keep it holy. He said <clears throat> in Exodus 31, this is verse, starting in verse 16, uh, he said it's an eternal sign between him and his people Israel. 
um, in verse 16 and this is 30 Exodus 31 16 and 17 so the sons of Israel shall observe the Sabbath to celebrate the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant it is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever uh, for in six right. days the Lord made heaven and earth but on the seventh day he ceased from labor and was refreshed okay Jeremiah 31 there's only one covenant and it's with a house of Israel and house of Judah this Sabbath is a sign between God and Israel it says forever and to me what's especially interesting in in uh, Mark chapter 2 if you read uh, starting in verse 27 it's when uh, the disciples were coming into going through the field and they were picking a few heads of grain and rubbing it between their hands and eating it and some of the religious leaders well they're threshing on the Sabbath which uh, again that's not contrary Torah says you can you can eat you can prepare your food on Sabbath they were not threshing and gathering you know uh, baskets and bushels of, of grain but uh, but in Mark 2 verse Mark 27 two. Uh, Jesus said to them, said, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now that's interesting. People say, See, it was not uh, it was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, so the man can do what he wants. Not so. God if the Sabbath was made for man, I think you and I talked about this in DC, Marcy, uh, that the Sabbath was made especially for man, and that word is mankind. It's not talking just the Jews. It's, it's ethnos. It's all of mankind. So Sabbath was made for man. Why on earth would I not want to fully embrace something that God made especially for me? Why? Why wouldn't I want to fully embrace that? Um and he said so the son of man is lord even of the sabbath so if jesus is is this generally referred to the son of man is that's jesus referred to himself that way a few times so if jesus is lord of the sabbath and the sabbath was especially made just for me james 1 says every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, okay? So if the Sabbath was made for me, it's a good and perfect gift. Why on earth would I not want God's gift right. that he made for me? Why right. Why on earth would I not want that? So that's uh, you know, so that's another question I ask. Even if even if you're, you don't want to look at the Old Testament, what do you do with what Jesus said? And uh, And we've already read that Paul was teaching people about Jesus and to be zealous for the law so which includes keeping Sabbath we already read it was a sign between him and Israel forever so uh, there's I you know I would say show me in the scripture where God removed his blessing from the Sabbath where Jesus said I don't need to be Lord of the Sabbath anymore and um, you better have some really good solid scriptures which there aren't any because you got some really good solid scriptures on the importance of the Sabbath um, right. so I, you know that's one thing the thing about food um, when people say well you you know we eat clean I, I would just say I eat, I eat the food that I, I, I eat the things that God says is food I don't eat the things that God says are not food so uh, Two places that get that get referred to a whole bunch. Mark chapter seven. There's mm -hmm. a verse that says, "By doing this, Jesus declared all foods to be clean." Right. Again, the context you have to read the context starting in the Food. first chapter. It's about ceremonial cleansing. That mm -hmm. there's a ceremonially hand washing, and the they were and and the religious leaders were saying, "Your disciples don't do the ceremony, uh, the ceremony before right. eating," and Jesus is is saying, you know, it's it's a whole, a whole lot more what comes out of the mouth that makes a man unclean, not what goes into his stomach. He said, and then in parentheses, which means it's not even in. I've looked in the Greek; it's not in the Greek. And it says, by doing so, Jesus declared all foods clean. Okay, now one, 
the context is, is being ceremonially clean. Two, if you, if you were going to come to my house, and I said, well, I'm not going to be there when you get there, Marcy. I know you're going to be hungry. You had a long trip. But so make yourself at home. You can anything anything you find there to you want to fix to eat. Just help yourself. You know I would not worry that I was going to come home and find my dog skinned and on a rotisserie. Right. Because you and I don't consider a dog to be food in our culture. Some cultures do, but our culture does not consider a dog to be food. So I would not think I would need to say, now don't eat my dog if I told you to go make anything you want to eat. I, I, because we already have an understanding of what food is. And the people he's speaking to, they ate the things God said was food. And they did not assume they didn't think a pig was food. They didn't think a donkey was food. They didn't think a dog was food. Uh, they didn't think a hawk or an owl was food. Uh, so the, even if he's declaring all foods clean, he's not redefining the term food. There too, right. you know, you, you, you've got this whole culture that would know what he was talking about. Um, you know, it's kind of like if, if we said, you know, do you ever go eat at Mickey D's? Everybody would probably know. We're probably talking about a restaurant called McDonald's. But somebody right. coming along from, uh, you know, Nigeria or, or, I don't they're pretty much everywhere now. I don't know. <laughs> the, the Amazon jungle or something, you know, they would go, well, Mickey D, I have no idea what that is. Uh, you know? right. so, so it's the sort of thing. He's not redefining the meaning of food. He's talking about ceremonial and cleansing. Look at it in context. Same thing, the other verse that gets used a lot is in Acts 10. And that's where mm -hmm. Peter has a vision. And it says three right. times the sheep comes down from heaven and all these all sorts of creepy crawly critters and everything in it. And three times God says, take, eat. And Peter's like, no, no, Lord, no. And he says, and God tells him, do not call unclean what I have called clean. And people said, see, he did, a, he did away with his eternal, his eternal word, the, the word that lasts forever. God did away with it. It didn't last right. forever is what that, what that, if that's your conclusion. However, if you read on in chapter 10, Peter interprets the dream or the vision. And right. he interprets it to be referring to calling Gentiles unclean. Because the, the, the sheet came down three times, and then immediately afterwards, three Gentile men show up at his house and say, will you go with us? And they felt like he, he was supposed to go. And that was when they realized that, that the salvation offered through Yeshua was not just for Judah, but it was for all the nations. And um, so Peter, I, again, I would and I would ask your pastor. So, do you think you have a better understanding of Peter's vision than Peter did? Because Peter explains his vision later on. And those are the two. See, my pastor, he, really, he knows it. Like my pastor, we sat and talked about it at my kitchen table, and he knew the vision. He understood it completely. And I said, well, then why do you think that that meant what you're saying? It meant he goes, well, he wouldn't have used the analogy of meat fall falling from the sky or, you know, if he didn't mean that we could eat whatever we wanted. I'm like. <laughs> yeah, but again, but again, OK, go back to the foundation. That's why I wanted. That's why I started the way I did. God's yeah. word is eternal. God yeah. does not contradict himself. Jesus did not contradict God the Father. Right. Paul and Peter did not contradict the God. They didn't contradict the written word of God. And so mm -hmm. if you're coming up with a trend of a conclusion that contradicts this foundation that was laid, that there is no way that it can be correct. Again, in Peter's right. mindset, there's no way it could be referring to uh, other animals besides 
as far as physically eating because if that were the case then God's word did not last forever it was not eternal and that again if the foundation is there you you start seeing well wait a minute that I kind of took a wrong turn with that interpretation because that interpretation totally contradicts all this previous stuff and right. um and a, a, a similar thing with um, about our sins and such in Colossians chapter 2. Um, that verse, uh, what is it, verse 13 and 14, uh, Paul's writing to the Col Colossian church. It says, you were, dead in your trans you were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, but God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And I have heard that as saying, see, the law was nailed to the cross and it was done away with. But that's not what it says. It says the list of my debt, my trespasses. That's that's what the picture was when do you remember when Yeshua was on the cross and and Pilate put a sign over his head said um, Jesus King of the Jews and the religious leaders said no 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 you need to put up he said he was King of the Jews and Pilate said what I've written I've written it stands it was common to put a, a list of the charges over the the person being executed over their head and what what Colossians 2 says is the record of debt my trespasses that debt was listed your your trespasses was listed and that's what was nailed to the cross have you ever told a lie okay Eleanor the liar have I ever taken anything yeah I did I've taken stuff that didn't belong to me. Eleanor the thief. Those are the charges that were against me. Does that mean now it's okay to tell lies and it's okay to steal? That's See, no. that's kind of the crazy thing that when people want to pick and pull, like they pull the fourth commandment out. So they're saying, okay, it's okay to dishonor your parents and commit adultery and lie and steal and bear false witness and... Um, but they want they want you to keep all the other ones, just not that fourth one. Um, right. So this is not exhaustive at all. It's exhausting, I think. But but the thing is, it's faithful. God's word is faithful all the way to the end. And I want to show you something um, in Revelation twelve. Pull it up and share the screen. Um, go down. It talks about um, the dragon and the go that goes off to make war with the offspring of the woman, which are the people of God. But there in verse uh, 17, the people of God are identified as those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Okay? Twofold. They keep the commandments and they hold to the testimony of Jesus. You have a similar picture in Revelation 14 verse 12 and let me go there and it says here is a call for the endurance of the saints and this is how they are identified those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Yeshua or Jesus okay God is faithful all the way to the end and he's looking for people who will be faithful all the way to the end. And we will be identified in the last days. We'll be identified as people who keep the commandments of God 
and hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. So hopefully we can do both and hold fast to both of them because they're both important. Because Jesus is the Savior of the world, is our Messiah and our Lord and Savior, but he's also the Word of God made flesh. And he says, if we love him, we'll obey him. And his commandments begin in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation. So hopefully that makes a little bit of sense um, and gives you a, a foundation to start with. Um, and I see some have dropped off and all, but Deanna, or anybody got any questions or comments or thoughts or any input? Yeah, I mean... I think that um, some of it, too, is that Jesus did fulfill the first spring feast, but the fall feast, or the last three feasts, really, are yet to be fulfilled. You know, the trumpets and stuff, right. or revelation and stuff. So, I think that that's where some people, like, like you said, they take just that one little part and run with it, basically, of, oh, the you know, it doesn't matter or whatever, but... If, if you see or kind of um, what each feast represents, you can see how Jesus, you know, was the Passover lamb and, you know, but there's still feasts that haven't been fulfilled yet, you know. <laughs> right. And, and, and he fulfilled as in he, he walked out the picture yes. of yes. That, that each of those feasts. But even so, they still, uh, if you read in Acts, you still have Paul going back to Jerusalem to bring his sacrifice for Passover. So it's like, yeah. uh, we've used the example that we look just as much as Abraham and Noah and David looked forward by faith to the day of Yeshua. We look back by faith. Mm -hmm. And the sacrifices of Moses and David and such were looking forward by faith to the ultimate sacrifice of Yeshua as the Passover lamb. Uh, yes. We look back by faith. And the, the, uh, the, when the, uh, they're, according to Ezekiel, the, the temple will be rebuilt and the sacrifices will be reinstated, but it will be looking back as a memorial mm -hmm. now to that. Uh, but they, they, they both have a place. And, yeah. and as Jesus fulfilled each of them, he helped us. He fleshed out that picture, but he still didn't do away yeah. with it because that's part of God's commands, and it says his commands are eternal uh, with it. So, yeah, and and uh, there's a sacrifice at each of those feasts, and Jesus is actually each of those sacrifices. He is the Passover yeah. lamb, but he's also the first fruits of the resurrection. He's also... Uh, the spotless and without leaven of the Feast of Unleavened mm -hmm. Bread. He is the Word made flesh that was in the Word was given at Shavuot, our, our Feast of Weeks that we just had um, mm -hmm. during Dynasty. Uh, in the fall, he is, uh, the Feast of Trumpets is when the Lord's going to return uh, and, and mm -hmm. when he's going to uh, call forth uh, uh, the, the nations. And, and, and then the, the Feast of Yom Kippur, he's the Day of Atonement. He is the atoning sacrifice for us. And then finally, he is the bridegroom who gathers in the nations at the Feast of Tabernacles. It's called, one of its names is the Feast of the Nations. So mm -hmm. he is all those things. And it's, and it's a rich heritage. And it's sad that you have people who only look at part of it and say, oh, that's done away mm -hmm. with. And it's, and it's like, no, God's word is eternal. Mm -hmm. And, and his, his law is eternal according to his scripture. And all the way to Revelation, he still identifies his people as those who hold fast to his, his commandments and hold fast to Yeshua. So it's, it's, it's a dual picture. It's not either or. It's we get to do both. Mm -hmm. So awesome. Well, any more comments, thoughts? 
Anybody? No. All right, then. I think it was another amazing lesson. <laughs> well, great. it's, I, I, I encourage you, I, I, we flew through a lot of stuff. I would encourage you to read, like, the whole chapter around stuff on all these things. That's yeah. why I gave you the verses is do not take my word for it. And, uh, uh, you know, but look for yourself, but realize that if God's word is what it says it is, then there will be consistency throughout the word. And where we see the inconsistency, yeah. we kind of need to look and say, well, am I missing something in the context? Is mm-hmm. there, you know, some something I'm missing? And when we can go at it that way, then we can see that, um, no, God's consistent. He's one mm-hmm. with the Son. His, one, his Spirit didn't, none of those guys took off on a different tangent than the original message, which yeah. was in the garden that God desired fellowship with his people and he's still calling Adam where are you and he's calling to us where are you come on back Mm -hmm. so awesome well thank you for joining me and whoever watches this uh, I appreciate your comments again I'm I'm not an expert but this is just things I've seen in my walk over the years so we'll hopefully try to do this again next week good lord willing yeah. and yeah, uh, always <laughs> see see what what there is so thanks so much for joining me and i'll say good night good night thank you thanks bye-bye <laughs>